Buenas noches. We're going to go ahead and get our meeting started.
hope you're feeling blessed. And I also hope you're a little tired. Very tired. Uh, that means you're working. We want people to be working. It's good to work. We're going to take a little break, though, this afternoon, this evening, and uh, spend some time in fellowship. And we're going to hear some nice stories that hopefully will lift us up and strengthen us and give us the energy to run into the rest of the week. So um, it's all good to really see you. I'm blessed to see you tonight. Why don't we stand? We'll open our service in prayer. Brother Joe, would you lead us in prayer? Our most high God, we thank you, dear Lord, for all that you do. Dear Lord, you bless us in ways that we see and in many more which are unseen. I know you've been taking care of each one of us this week, no matter where we've been. And Lord, you accept, I'm sure, your spirit and angels at times, Lord, to be around us. Thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you for keeping us well and allowing us, Lord, even in this midweek to be here together in your church and to be able to spend some time thinking about the good things of God, hearing about work that's being done, Lord, for, for you on your behalf, for the church. And I pray, Lord, that all of us would be blessed by our, our brother Greg's report this evening. You'd inspire his words about all the good things that are happening. And Lord, we recognize how much there is to do and how we all need to play our part and our role in Lord, the work progressing. But Lord, without you, nothing will happen. You are the key to all of our victories, to all of our success, Lord. And we pray that we can always follow your lead and you would stand beside us. You would be our forward, you would be our rearward in anything and all things that we do. Forgive us of our shortcomings. Strengthen us, Lord. And Lord, if we are tired this evening, I ask you, Lord, to recharge our batteries and give us all that we need. And bless all those who are not here tonight. Bless all of our people, all of our loved ones, our friends, those we know who are sick, those who are grieving, those who are hurting this morning, this night. We know your power. We know what you're able to do. And we thank you for it, and we ask for it that tonight many good things would be happening that you would do for your people. Be with us, bless us, guide us, and direct us tonight. Is my prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now, am I actually stuck in this spot or can I move around? <laughs> How many recognize these books? A few of you. Okay. These are two books by Tim Busey, minister in the church, who put a lot of work into the missionary field. Okay. And we're still handing out these books, by the way. One is The Jew and the American Indian. The other is The American Indian Moses. Tim Busey would leave his family, leave his home, catch a bus, and go to a place called Oklahoma <laughs> for two weeks at a time, two, three times a year, back before cell phones. <laughs> so there's no way to contact him. There's no way to find out what's going on or anything else. His grandsons have picked up this work <laughs> and have continued it continued that part of basically what is the legacy we call the Oklahoma work. Julie can chase him down. <laughs> um, it's a difficult thing to imagine. We are the closest branch to Oklahoma. Correct. Okay. 
We have ministers coming from the East Coast. We have ministers coming from the West Coast. They meet in Oklahoma two, three, sometimes four times a year. And that's it. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're doing a wonderful job. But when I was growing up, the Fuller Brush Man came more often. You know, you think about it. We're supposed to be out doing this work. And it's difficult because of the distance. It's difficult because of life. It's difficult because of everything that we've got going on. I mean, it was, it was also difficult for Tim when he started. <laughs> but it's difficult even today. A lot of work going on. So a couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go and team up with Stacy. You know, like like I told him when they said, "Well, we'll have, have you teamed up with Stacy?" Like, and I said, "Oh, he did babysitting, huh?" <laughs> you know, because I had no idea what they were doing. You know, and I get up to go and follow him around and, and see what's what. So I teamed up with Stacy, and there were three other teams. Four teams in all who were working in there. Is it that anymore? I don't know. You know, I was on one of the teams. But it's interesting to see. Now, Stacy and I, I have to sit down and think of all the names today. <coughs> Stacy and I not only went to see the Ponta, we spent a couple days up there, and we're going to get to that. Okay. But we also went to the Asajj Reservation. Um, which is kind of interesting because we're on the Osage Nation. But the gentleman that we're meeting, this, this gentleman and his grandson, by the way, when somebody in Native American circles study to, this is my son, this is my daughter, this is my grandson, they may not be related by blood. <laughs> you know, just, just catch the blue there. <laughs> okay. But they still take on the role. So, you know, this young man that we were meeting with, he's in his late 30s, maybe, and he's got a grandson who's a full grown adult, <laughs> you know. But he is still the grandfather to that, that gentleman. So, we're meeting with this grandfather and grandson on the Asajj Reservation, and they are. Ottawa, Missouri tribe. And that's more than there. <laughs> you know? And it's it's hard to tell what tribe, just because you're on a certain reservation, doesn't mean the people on that reservation are necessarily of that tribe. They may be married or living with somebody who is of that tribe, or they may not be. We found an interesting thing when, when uh, he was driving from one area to another, and we were following him. We looked at this license plate, and it was OA 10. And we're going, wait a minute. And we asked him later when we got there, we said, Whose car is that? And he said, Well, it's my wife's. I said, Who is she? <clears throat> 10 means we were high up. They got the tenth plate issued by the nation, <laughs> you know. And she was granddaughter of one of the councilmen, and so she was she was uh, first in line to get her license plate type thing. But we went to the Asajj Reservation and met with them there. We went to the Ka Reservation. That was kind of an interesting thing because. You have to watch what you say and do among the Native Americans. Okay. Apparently, somebody was a little forceful here a few years back, saying, Well, I'm from the church and we're going to blah, 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 blah. And they said, Never come back. We went in English. <laughs> we went in English. And it was kind of interesting because Stacy went into the building and and uh, I didn't. Uh, I decided to walk around outside. 
and this woman came up and she said, it's cold out here, come on into the museum and I'll show you some things. And she showed me around the, she was the woman who told us never come back. <laughs> we opened that door again, I hope. <laughs> so we're, we're taking a look at the, the Tower Reservation. Citizen Potawatomi. That is an interesting reservation to go to if you ever get the chance. We have a very good museum there. <clears throat> lots and lots of history. They can tell you about all sorts of things. We, we got to sit with their head of their language department and go through the museum with him. And one piece of sculpture that I really liked in the museum it showed all these white pieces of paper and they were suspended on wires and it looked like they were just fluttering down from the ceiling. And I said, tell me about it. This really looks significant. And he says, those 40 pieces of paper represent the 40 trees that the white man broke with us. <laughs> they weren't worth the paper. <laughs> there was nothing printed on them. He said, the only time they ever get their word is when they said they were going to take your land. <laughs> okay. That particular reservation, the Potawatomi, if you go into the museum, you'll see a picture of the old beat up trailers, had three cars out front to give you the idea of the work of these cars. And one of the nicer looking of the three was the green one. <laughs> You know, so I had these three cars parked with the trailer. He says, that's when we had that trailer and two acres. That's all they had for the whole reservation. They have since bought back most of their land. So you look at different reservations and there's, you can see different drives, you can see lots of different ways they interact with the world, lots of different ways they interact with white people, well, lots of different things about the reservation that will be different for each one. I once went to a reservation in San Diego County, out there in California, has zero people on it. Why? Because they didn't trust white men and they didn't make out wills, and they gave so much land to each one of their tribal members, and when that person died, there was no will, so that land got divided equally amongst all their heirs, and now it's down to where each person owns one square inch. So nobody can live on the reservation. I've seen other reservations that I literally walked down the street and found a young man laying in the gutter with a gasoline soaked rag over his face. And you just reach down and flip the rag off and he gets an oxygen. And you keep going. You don't say anything. You don't want to embarrass him. This picture is still alive, still ready. Keep going. Okay. In that same valley, I have seen other reservations that you look at the homes, and this is a modern housing project. <laughs> the one I'm thinking of, the government said they wanted to come in and build a home and gave the tribe some money for the home. And the tribal council said, fine, we'll, we'll accept your money. Come on in, we're going to build, I guess it was three homes they had built. And he said, but here's our condition you will hire. Members of our tribe to be your assistants all through the bill. So the plumber will have plumbing assistants that are from the tribe. The carpenters will have carpenter assistants from the tribe. Every every aspect of the home will have assistance from the tribe. That's okay. So they ended up in, in building these three homes. Tribal council thanked them, signed it off. So have a nice day. Now bring in those assistants. Build us three more. Okay. They knew what they were doing and they were working for their people. And you see different reservations with different aspects of this. Potawatomi was definitely one of them. Okay. Uh, right next door was the 
absentee Shawnee. They didn't show up for the land, <laughs> so they were called the absentee Shawnee. <laughs> and guess what? They weren't there when we were there, so we didn't see them. <laughs> so um, I'm sure they, they're very interesting people. I haven't had a chance to meet them yet. Um, Tunkawah, I got to meet a gentleman who's about my age, uh, Air Force though, so we won't hold that music. But a guy named Don, he's a member of the, the Tunkawah tribe, we met in a casino. Oh, I'm buying breakfast, you know. And Don was a former chief of the tribe. So. <laughs> With, you know, these contacts have been groomed over the years, and you just kind of renew friendships as you go along. And at the same time, you try to make new friendships. Charles was another, another Air Force. <laughs> He's Comanche. He was the last day of our, our trip, it was, it was the Comanche tribe. And uh, so he was, he was another one that, uh, he was an honorary Comanche. Gentleman's a black man, but he has worked with the tribe all his life, and so he is considered a Comanche. Doesn't matter your skin color; it demands it. It's better determined by the color of the heart and where that is. And so he was, he was one of them that uh, we really enjoyed. Sitting down, having some time with and, and talking to them about the various things that are, that are going on here. Give you some idea now on the Ponto. Let's circle back to them. Shelly managed to look up Eagle on Facebook. <laughs> Whether that works. And we met Eagle. Um, when we first arranged to go up and meet with Eagle, he had us sitting in a conference room and we were presented to the entire tribal council. Um, I think there was one missing or something that we've since met. But uh, we were in and, and you know the whole council was asking us questions about our church, about why we're here. Um, you know me, I'm very shy. No, I never, never talk about <laughs> uh, You know, the head councilman looked at me and he said, what's the deal? And I said, scripture tells us that we're supposed to be nursing mothers and fathers. I said, from the lips of things, we've done a very poor job. And they would ask us all these various questions about our intent and all one of the things that is not uncommon and that I hadn't heard before, but Shelly and I got hit with it, I said, well, we want to come up, we want to work with you, we want to, you know, do things with you, and he said, fine, what do you move here? <laughs> <laughs> What's the commitment? What's the commitment? Are you moving here or not? You know, you say you want to do this stuff, show me. You know? And he said, are you moving here? And I said, the Lord tells me to move here. <laughs> you know, uh, he hasn't told us to move there yet. Let me tell you about Punk. Punk Reservation has this beautiful green park. We've been in it. It was the first fancy dance uh, ceremony contest was held there. And they got this huge boulder with the winner's name and shit and all this sort of thing in the park. And it's got a river that runs right alongside the park. The river, river is so polluted you cannot swim in it. You cannot fish from it. Their groundwater is so polluted they don't drink it. Instead they have to have water piped in. It's all because of local industry that is just totally devastated their little bitty postage stamp of a reservation they were given. Okay. 
That is what you've got going on at home. Now let me tell you about a very proud moment for me. Second trip up to Ponca, we did two trips up to Ponca while we were up there in Oklahoma. The second trip up to Ponca, we were supposed to meet with the head librarians. So Stacy and I get there and we go in and she's running around in the library trying to fan out books and what have you. It had been pouring rain and the library roof leaked. And I mean, it had that fiberboard ceiling, drop ceiling that had soaked through and crashed down and, and all this sort of thing. And as the other brothers came in, it was Ron and Wayne came in, and they were looking around and we were going, okay, let's get to work. And two of them got on ladders and they were lowering down the ceiling and this and I'm running around trying to figure out, okay, we move the electronics over here so they don't get wet and this and this and this. I'm so proud of our church because you know, we just get right to work. And I'm sure they noticed this. Okay. And I'm on the phone calling Eagle and I said, get a crew over here. You know? And you know, we need to move the display case to make sure that their the headdress and the display case is ruined, you know, this sort of thing. And we're moving and we're we're just working to help our brothers and sisters on that reservation. And I was very pleased in that. Okay. But again, we're restricted by how far apart we are from the reservation of being more of a help on a regular basis. They could use help like that every day. I mean, that happened to be during the freezing rainstorm that hit up there. And so we had problems with rain. They had problems with ice. They had problems with trees all over the place. A lot of the homes had no electricity and they weren't expecting electricity for probably two weeks because they were the last to get it. And so they were saying it's going to be a while. Instead, what they are doing is they are cooking and heating their homes based on the fireplace. You know, but they've been doing that before. They know how to do that. And they were going to do that. Could they use people out there help them? Hatch rooms or what have you? Sure. Could we take and take a, a youth activity group up there and say, see this elder's house? It needs painting. Here's the brushes. Yeah. Okay. That sort of thing we could do if we were closer. We're not close enough to do things like that on a regular basis. It was like when I was talking with the online with the Oklahoma group, and they were saying, well, we're going to try and get up there here a couple weeks ago, about a month back, we were talking about, well, we're going to try and get up there, and then we'll try and have three visits next year. And I think it was George I was talking to, the guy I contact with, and I'm going, I uh, hope I'm not out of line, but she only might want to go every month. <laughs> you know, sorry. <laughs> sorry, we can look close. We're going to get up there. And Ponca is going to be one of the spots that we're going to be going to because we have an invite there. Okay? You don't get an invite at every reservation. Okay? And this is the first time that the church has ever gotten through with the Ponca Reservation and had some significant contact with the Ponca Reservation. The Lord has opened the doors. We're going to step on through okay, and try to do what we can up there. A lot of reservations, you go up there and you talk to them. One of them that I've listed here that I talked about, one of the six that we attended. Um, they were very polite. They were very cordial. It was also easily seen through that because if you white people were moving like this, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> you know, it, you can feel the tension. 
And again, it's going to take consistent contact, consistent, consistently be in there for them, even if it's just in prayer. Okay. Um, Ponca Reservation, we know the, the one woman who is on the tribal council. She has that very cold Native American exterior. And it was like, okay, you're here. There's nothing I can do about it. You know, uh, we were told, by the way, at the first council meeting that the Ponca are proud of the fact that they've never killed a white man. So we hope not to break that streak. <laughs> but she was very old and what have you. She got COVID. She was going from bad to worse. Joe, I don't need the handkerchief that we took up there. And that afternoon, instead of being intubated like they said she was going to be, she started to improve. That was just boom, right now. And the Lord has answered our prayers on other things. And we're understanding that we are great, that we are great people, we are Christian people, and they have no problem with that. Along with the fact that they have never killed a white man. Yeah. <laughs> the punk are also proud of the fact that when Brigham Young was headed to Salt Lake City for two different winters, the scouts from Brigham Young wintered over with the punk. <laughs> so they know about the Book of Mormon. <laughs> They're going, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, this is nothing new to us. So they had some contact with it. Okay. A lot of different tribes will know about the Book of Mormon. They won't know about the Church of Jesus Christ. So we're there telling them about us and making sure they know about the Book of Mormon. If they want a copy here, here's a copy. You know, they want a copy of uh, American Indian and Moses. Here's a copy. You know, give them some literature and swap phone numbers and, and be in contact. You know, throughout the year, trying to get back for the next visit. A lot of them will know about the Book of Mormon. They won't know about the church. And they won't have a complete understanding of what the Book of Mormon means as far as to them as a Native American. They maybe heard something about the fact that it had something to do with them. They're not even sure how. You know, this is kind of like, yeah, well, I don't know, it's one of those Christian things, <laughs> you know. And they're, they're not really aware that it's their history and their prophecy. They don't know that this book is talking about them when it says they're going to be coming back on this land. And they're like, okay, what does that mean? I don't know. You know. They, they have no idea. So we're up there talking to them about that. Don, the gentleman that was um, on the wall. As Stacy is sitting there explaining to him the Book of Mormon, explaining to him that the uh, choice here is going to come forward and that, you know, the Native Americans are going to gather together with the choice here and except their, their rightful role as leaders on this land. He said, yeah, that's not going to happen. And he says, what? He said, that's not going to happen. Native Americans will not gather together, period. It won't happen. I reached over and touched his hand. It's okay, Don. It says in the book that you won't be with us. That's the bottom line. <laughs> okay. And if you really think about it, what we're doing 
and well, that doesn't quote scripture. What we're doing is we are going forward and we are taking the word to the seed of Joseph. But it says in the scripture that the choice seer will have the convincing power of the word that has already gone forward to them. Our job is to take the word. But he has the convincing power. In other words, they're not going to believe us. That's okay. Moses was in the same boat. Go to Pharaoh. He won't believe you. I'll oh, hurt his heart. <laughs> you know. But there's a reason for it. And it's not until the choice seer comes about that they are going to say, oh, yeah, that's what they were talking about. And we're going to say, that's what we're talking about. Now, does that mean that absolutely nobody is ever going to get baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ until the, the choice here comes? No. We've already had people baptized from different reservations of this church. That means that as a group, they're not going to believe us. And so we need to understand that as well. We need to be respectful. We need to make sure we're not pushy. Okay. That is something that Native Americans have learned the hard way to be literate. Let's put it that way. Glenn Jordan had a very important role on the Navajo Nation. He was first counselor to the president. According to the Governing rules, the, the charter, the whatever they have, the Navajo Nation. Had anything happened, had the president of the Navajo Nation and the vice president died in a car wreck together or something like that, Dwayne Jordan, the white man, would have been in charge of the tribe. <laughs> okay, he had a very important role. One of his duties was to tell people when they had to present things to the tribe, to the council, how to go about it. And he had a couple of people he was talking to one time, he was telling the story. And one was wanting to set up a, a restaurant chain, I don't know, McDonald's or something, on the reservation. And the other was a banking group from Germany. And he's just talking to them. He's saying, look, you, you've got to be patient. And McDonald says, well, then, yeah, we'll be patient. That's no problem. And the, the German said, no, you know, this has to be decided today. He said, okay. McDonald's goes first. And they presented their, their spiel to the, to the council and said, you know, you can look it over. This is what it says here, but have your attorneys look it over and at your convenience, contact me and, you know, we'll just work with this as it comes up. And they thank you for his, his time. They may have even approved it on the spot. I don't remember the story completely at this time. Next up was the Germans. We need this done, and we need this done now. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Council left. <laughs> and they're going, what happened? We pushed them. Well, the same is true on every, almost every single reservation. As much as you can make a, a blanket statement like that, if you get pushy, whether you're talking to a council or you're talking to an individual, it's going to be motion to adjourn. And you're going to be left standing because they've learned when people start getting pushy, that means they're looking to pull something over on them. And they won't have it anymore. Okay? How many of you are aware of the Supreme Court decision with regards to Oklahoma and the law, basically? Okay. <laughs> 
Basically, what happened was the gentleman, uh, killed someone, murdered. He was a Native American. And the other person who is no longer amongst us was also Native American. It happened on an Indian reservation. And the sheriff came onto the reservation and picked him up, put him in the matching bracelets, and called him off. They went into court, and the judge said, How do you plead? Guilty or innocent? The attorney stood up and said, Neither, Your Honor. Says, no, your two choices are guilty or innocent. <laughs> you know, which is it? He says, No, this court has no jurisdiction. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. We weren't sure what that would mean. We thought it would mean that you couldn't go onto a reservation and arrest somebody without involving the tribal police or something like that. The decision handed down by the United States Supreme Court was the eastern third of Oklahoma belongs to Native Americans. Tulsa. Pardon? It includes Tulsa. Which includes Tulsa, which includes Oklahoma City. I think it's in there, <laughs> just inside. Okay. And basically it's saying that they are going to be the governing body. Doesn't mean that because you own a house in Tulsa that you can say goodbye to your house. <laughs> that's that's not what they're looking to do. They're saying who is the governing body that is controlling this area? And they said, this belongs to Native Americans. Bit of history. How many reservations are there in the state of Texas? One. Three. Three in the entire state of Texas. Why? Because when Texas was becoming a state, they took all the Native Americans and pushed them into a place called Indian Territory, Oklahoma. <laughs> okay. They took them out of the state of Texas. Oklahoma, by the way, was once part of Texas. Texas went on up practically to Wyoming. <laughs> okay. But they put all the Native Americans up there, and then Texas doesn't have them down here. So there's a lot of Native Americans who were placed in that state, that area, from the north, from the east, from the south. They're all just pushed together. And then gradually, the government starts cutting back their land, cutting back their land, cutting back their land. Now, with this Supreme Court decision, they're saying this land now goes back to the seat of Joseph for them to govern. Wayne, I believe, was just commenting at uh, lunch when we got together up there in Oklahoma. And he was. You're saying that they were talking to this one chief about that decision. And the chief said that our attorneys have been contacting Oklahoma and contacting Oklahoma. We need to sit down and negotiate this and figure out how this transition is going to take place. What's it going to look like in the middle of it? What's it going to look like at the end of the transition? What's it going to, you know, we know what it looks like now, but how is this going to go? They've been stonewalled. And the chief said, you know, we're running out of patience. It's going to be no more Mr. Nice Guy. And it's like, oh, no. So watch the news about Oklahoma. <laughs> There's going to be some, some things involving the seat of Joseph. And they're going to be asserting themselves, as it should be. So it's going to be, a, it's going to be an interesting time of change with all of this. In the meantime, as a church, we've got to get in there and let them know that, hey, there's, there's more to this than just a political move and a court decision. Because this is the record. This is the history. This is what's going to take place in the future. And we need to let you know that. Again, you may or may not believe us. 
But here it is. And lay it out for you. You'd be surprised how many are listening and going, oh, that sounds pretty good. Don wasn't convinced that we could get them all to follow one Native American, but others have said, I'd like to know more. I want to hear about this. And oftentimes we're meeting in restaurants where, you know, come on, we'll buy you breakfast. You know, Don happened to be in a casino. Don't recommend ever going into those places because you know, cigarette smoke, the stench, but you get out and you want to take a shower. <laughs> but, you know, meet in a restaurant, talk to them, share with them what's going on, and share with them while you're there. And you also start developing a friendship. And that's the most important point of all of this, is the friendship. Sorry, you want to get something? Well, tell them about the, the sweat lodge that we helped build and, um, you know, what we're doing, the physical stuff. Eagle, we get up there, Eagle says, I, I need help. Okay, what do you need help on? A sweat lodge. And I'm going, eh. <laughs> <laughs> we're building the building, we're not going to go this way. Okay. <laughs> you know, and so we're putting together this building. So you, you bury poles on the ground, you bend them over, bury from the other side, tie them off, and you, you build this dome shaped structure about yay tall and probably 12 feet to 15 feet across. So we get this. Sweat Lodge built. One of the gentlemen who was up there that we got to meet, that we hadn't met the first time we were up there, was a guy named Scotty. <coughs> Sounds like he belongs on Star Trek. Okay. And Scotty is bending poles and we're tying off and, and doing it. Scotty's one of the council. Okay. We're sitting there putting together a sweat lodge that there's no way we were going to be participating in. But Scotty's there working with us. The day of the rain, I believe it was Wayne who said he was a little disappointed because he had hoped that when they met at the library that he would be able to meet with, you know, meet at least meet someone from the tribal council. Because that was one of the things they hoped for. I said, remember that guy in overalls? The one that went up on the roof? He said, yeah. I said, that's Scott, he's not really the driver console. <laughs> he was up there on the roof, pushing the water off, <laughs> you know, trying to get things going. Um, a lot of the times you're not aware of who you're meeting when you're, when you're meeting with various people on the reservations. You're not aware of who they are related to and those distant relationships, like this is my grandson, when obviously you know that one, they don't look alike, and two, the age discrepancy is not enough. Um, that may be an important meeting. Uh, when we were on the Osage reservation, met with somebody and commented that we were going to go talk to Eagle, and he said, don't mention my name. Okay, is there a problem? I said, yeah, kind of. I used to be his sister. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that was in here. <laughs> it's like a church. You know, so it's like, <laughs> it's like church. It's like church. <laughs> Who are you related to? <laughs> so it's, it's a very interesting aspect of the culture. And again, an exciting one to, to get to know. Um, as you, you know, make contact. Yes. We went up for um, a, um, a, a these movie people were going to make a movie of Chief Standing Bear. Standing Bear, his daughter. His daughter. She's Standing Bear's daughter. So they had um, casting calls and they had a lot of Native Americans come up and 
big videotape doesn't have them talk about what they're what they're doing. So um, they just need to study those. Um, so one difference is in the culture is afterwards they had a picnic, you know, they they served us, and nobody would get in line until we were about the oldest ones there, until we got in line. Because we were the elders, we were the older, and the little kids were sort of last. They all just waited, and so that the you know, now we can just in front of them. But it's just a difference in the culture. And also, men get served first before women in many, many tribes. It wasn't so much so with the, the Ponga, but you could have other tribes. Um, Shoshone, the Apache, uh, some of those nations, men will eat first. I mean, you know, we kind of look at it and we go, what's, what gets here? I mean, you know, women are second class citizens? No, women are honored. And men must hurry up and eat so they can stand guard so the women can take their time. Okay? So the men are to. You serve first, but hurry up and get out there. <laughs> you know, protect the perimeter. So it's it's a different. There's a lot of different things in the culture that we look at and we, we don't fully understand. And that's okay. We just yeah. have to honor it and respect it. Yeah. Um, we joke around. In fact. Uh, the groom in the car last last night coming in. We joked around about hitting the, the Texas border and we could increase our speed on it. While we were sitting and having our lunch in the park at the, the casting party, one of these young men who, who was there, he said, I won't go to Texas again. I said, What? He said, I won't go to Texas. He said, The people are doing like 85 miles an hour. I said, look, if you don't want to do 85, get out of the slow lane. You can't just have a look at me. You can joke like that. And you can have some common life. And especially if the joke is on you. <laughs> and make fun of me and myself. Um, you have to be very careful about anything that they may interpret as you're making fun of them. Okay. Um, how many are watching YouTube videos? Am I the only one with all this pandemic stuff? That's what it's for, right? Fixing cars, you know, absolutely. <laughs> cars. I was watching one today, and it, it's a Native American group, and they're talking about you know all these various Native American videos that are out. And one day I'll put this video out and she was saying on how she had just witnessed this horrible scene because a person had dressed up as an Indian for Halloween and got punched right in the face. She said, it's horrible, it's horrible, but I'll do it again. <laughs> you know, and it's their way of saying just how difficult it is for them to see people take an aspect of their culture and use it as a Halloween costume. And people are not aware that each feather that is on their costume had to be earned. This is just something I found and so gone because this looks good. No, this was earned. There was a task to be done. There was something that they had to learn. There was something they had to demonstrate. You know, if you ever go to a powwow and the fancy dancers are very energetic, <laughs> okay? If you've ever seen fancy dance costumes and what have you, they're very flamboyant and they're very energetic. And if a feather comes off, you do not touch it. Stand there, you call one of the, the people from the powwow over and say, That dancer just lost his feather. You don't touch it. 
They have a ceremony involved in retrieving that letter and giving it back to it. That doesn't involve us. <laughs> okay. They have a whole thing that they have to go through. When you go to the powwow, you don't just, oh, hi, Joe, and walk across. No. They have gone through and they have dedicated the dance floor, and you cannot just walk across it willy nilly or anything like that. There's lots of rules that you have to follow. Okay. So if you ever want to go to one of those things, I say yes, go. Um, NAOC in their, their book says yes, go. Some of the people say, yeah, not quite sure I want to go because there's also some spiritual stuff in there that mm, it's not serving our Lord, okay? But if you ever want to go to one of those things, Go with somebody who's already been, somebody who knows what the etiquette is, so that you don't accidentally run afoul of it. Okay. You want to go to a reservation again? Go with somebody who's already been, and so that you know that okay, you know you've got some contacts up here. Um, you know, you're not going to inadvertently make the wrong move. In other words. If Shelly and I went up to the Pawnee Reservation and we went over and visited and talked with somebody on the Pawnee Reservation, and then we went up to the Ponca and said, you know, oh, we're just visiting with Pawnee, we would be showing the door. They are still killing each other. Literally, not a question of are they still angry with each other? There are still, until very recently, in you know, modern memory, people have ended up dying because they are a Ponca and they went on to a Pawnee reservation. You don't do it. Okay. And I'm sure they were turning the table too. Okay. So that is something that you would, you would know about that. Um, you'd also know, you know, if you have contact with various people on, on the reservation, how to interact, um, how they interact socially. People don't realize that, that women, this is something else showing you, we're just going through some stats. Women on a Native American reservation are seven times more likely, by national average, seven times more likely to be murdered. <laughs> A lot of abuse on the reservation. And it goes both ways. Right? You've got a question. Do they revere the man child more readily than the female child? Yes and no. Okay. Women are honored. Women have an honored role, and oftentimes the women will be um, North Dakota just had a reservation that a, a Native American tribe that has now not only got a female president of the reservation of the tribe, but the entire council is female. <laughs> and they're going, this is a first. <laughs> okay. So they're, the women have an honorary role. But like we're talking with our, our next door neighbor, and her daughter has three boys, two, two boys, and their father is Ponca. No, their father is half Ponca, but he is Ponca because he's a male. Okay, <laughs> and so it, there's different ways that that is addressed gender-wise, as far as different rights and, and different privileges. You really have to watch some of this stuff. Sometimes you'll see things on a reservation that um, they'll be real guarded about different things. Okay. When I was in college back in the dark ages, back in Colonel Custer's days, we had a, a gal in the dorm. And she was in sociology anyway. And so as her senior paper, 
she wrote up her Change Your Corporate Rights message from becoming a little girl to becoming a woman. And how they would go out and get a deer without putting any holes in the hide. And then how that hide was tanned so that instead of being dark brown or anything, it came out pure white. And all of this sort of thing, and how she had to sit on this hide for so many hours and, and not move, and all of this during the ceremony. This was all written up in her paper. She went home for Christmas. She's at her parents' home, they're on the reservation, not at the door. In comes the chief and the shaman. Okay, we're on. And the chief said, I've heard about this paper. Turned to the shaman and said, Did you give her permission to write this paper? He said, No. Did you? The chief said, No. The chief turned to the parents and said, You have no daughter. And walked out. Her name was taken off the walls. She shared something that hadn't been common knowledge. So sometimes you'll go onto a reservation and they won't want you to know things. You just respect them. You just go from there. Any other questions? I have a million, I have a million. <laughs> school teacher part of me, I have just a million of them. This is so interesting. It is. Fascinating to me. So it seems like what I'm hearing you say is the biggest obstacle uh, for any white man on, or white woman that enters the reservation is just to establish a level of trust and being respectful of them and their culture. Do you think, and maybe we just haven't got far enough along in our dealings with the people of Oklahoma as a church, but do you think their reluctance maybe to, to adopt the Christian faith is also their fear that they can give up their own culture? That the Christian practices and their native cultural practices don't exactly know. And I guess the follow up with that is simply when I was in Africa last year with my daughter, they converted people to Christianity, but they didn't want to give up the voodoo. They, they still had all this witchcraft stuff in their homes. Do you see the same kind of obstacles as, as for us as a church for them to adopt? Shelly and I spent the better part of the morning working on a sweat lodge tying it all together and getting it all covered. The next night, was it? Yeah, it was the next night they got it covered and Eagle went in to the sweat lodge and he spent probably hours in there praying to the, our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. <laughs> <You know? laughs> He is Christian. <laughs> okay. okay, but he's still in the sweat lodge praying to the Lord, you know. And you're going, okay, you know, that's, that's normally in their their culture, you went in the sweat lodge and you were chanting and sweating and you would have a vision. Okay, he took that and he's using that as a time of prayer. You're going in, you haven't eaten anything for several days. You maybe had some water yesterday, and you go into the sweat lodge, and that's kind of rare. <laughs> and I was like, could be, okay. But I'd rather it wasn't in the sweat lodge, you know. Um, so yes and no, we're seeing some of the same stuff, but that's been true, you know, I mean, Half of the stuff that, that you see practiced in Mexico with, with the Catholic Church is because they didn't want to take all the stuff away from the various tribes down there, and so they kind of brought it into the church. And, and you see some of that. So it's a matter of, gee, as they get to know the Lord, they're probably going to change their ways. Can I have a quick follow-up on Greg? I'm yeah. so sorry, because I'm sure everybody else has questions too. Can you just demystify a little bit for me the process by which the, the ministry, when they go there, because they do kind of keep it close to the vest. And I understand now, hearing everything you're saying, I get it. 
but like, do they have an agenda like every day or do they just kind of drive around and go to meet people? Like, is there, is there a schedule? How do you connect with people? Do you just pull up on a reservation and say hi? I mean, I always kind of wonder how it works. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How does that work? Are there cold calls? Yes. There are cold calls. There are. All right. There are, there are such a thing. Um, in fact, if we had found the absentee Sean that would have been a cold call. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> No, honestly, they are there. It is a reservation, um, but we were in the middle of freezing rain and trees were breaking left and right and they closed down the reservation. So they were absent for a reason. It was <laughs> you risk life and limb getting back under those trees. There are some cold calls. Obviously, you know how scattered I am. You know, you've seen me over the years. All right. I go nuts when everything is laid out. For those of you who don't know our brother Stacy Light, he is very, everything is written down. <laughs> and he has got at times, well, we're going to go to this reservation at this time. And if we finish up by two o'clock, then we're going to skip over to this reservation. <laughs> and we're supposed to meet so and so tomorrow morning at breakfast at this restaurant. So it's very set up and, and uh, that's good if it's a follow up with somebody that you know. Okay. Now, here's what the Oklahoma group is, I'm hoping that they see. Um, and I'm sure they do. I mean, obviously, right, ministry? We, we can win, right? <laughs> okay. George now has his traveling partner with him. It's his wife. Karen. Okay. I go up there with Shelly. This hasn't been done in Oklahoma. This hasn't been done in England, really. <laughs> okay. Heather? I mean, not Oklahoma. No. You know, I mean, how many times have we gone, you know, uh, maybe uh, when John and Carol go to the you know, <laughs> but. You know, it's it's not done normally as a husband and wife team, but we're seeing a benefit <coughs> to that. and so that it's changing. So while I am talking with the tribal council, Shelley's making contact with the councilwoman, and at the end, you know, the tribal council said, "Hey, we don't want handouts. We don't want anything from these people." You know, we're not pushing anything. This council only just holds shell and says, we need backpacks. So we ended up in getting how many backpacks did we get? Oh, 300? 200? 300, whatever it was. Backpacks that, that, we, that we could get and, and you know, took them in. And, and, you know, these are plain chain backpacks and, and took them in some painting supplies that they could paint them up with whatever they want to, you know, Native American type stuff, there's some stencils that you want to copy them, you know, that sort of thing. And just leave them. You know, don't expect to see them, don't expect them to be, here you go. And hopefully they use them. If they don't, well, they don't. Okay. But that contact wouldn't have been given to me. It's given to show. Okay. That here's a need. You know, um, have had people come to me and say, for the elders, we need food, or for the elders, we need this, that, or the other thing. Mask. Pardon? Mask. Mask. Yes, Chili's been sewing masks. <laughs> and so is, so is, yeah. um, um, others. Yeah. But, but also that, that, you know, the different things that they need and, we just go through Walmart. That's the biggest store around Honda. And, you know, you know, get a bunch of $60 Walmart carts here, you know, and these are as needed. But we do have some established relationships with some of the tribes. We do. That are longstanding. And I believe that we were allowed to preach in a church when you guys were up there. I think the point more allowed to preach as to open. 
He was at an open in a Baptist church. <laughs> so, we have some, so we do have some, a lot of groundwork has been done, you know, throughout the years. You know, it's, it's, and, and they do have some contacts that they see regularly. You know, it was kind of, I was taken back because we were taken into a Baptist church and I'm going, yeah, I've had interactions with Baptists before, thank you. <laughs> you know? And it wasn't always good ones. Uh, once they find out you got book Mormon is like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. They took us into the Baptist church. Wayne was taken up front. The rest of us were out, okay, you're a congregation. The minister stands up. You guys stand up. These are missionaries. <laughs> and I'm going, wow. <laughs> you know, I, I never thought I'd be called a missionary, you know. Especially by a Baptist. <laughs> but, you know, it's like that sort of contact, that is on a reservation, actually, between two reservations. But over the years, you form these relationships. And so it's not all cold calls, a lot of it is previous contacts. But if you run out of previous contacts, you can't find them, you do a cold call. And oftentimes what we do is we go out and we look for the person who's in charge of culture or the person who's in charge of language. Language is very important to Native Americans. If nobody speaks their language, they are not considered a tribe. Period. They lose their standing with the government and what they're doing. I'm going, how does that happen? You don't exist? What is this? Okay, so language is very important. Um, We should bring Eagle down here one day so that people can hear Ponga. <laughs> he, is, he is one of their language instructors. And actually he, you know, he would be willing to come down and watch what we go and get him bring him down and take him back. But uh, his grandfather is the head of the council. He looked at me, you know, when grandfather said something. Remember what he said? I said, yes, I remember. Yeah. Glad he translated it and he said, yeah, well, that's not grammatically correct. He's a stickler. He's a stickler. So, um, contact that I really liked was when was the kind of God you like. We were going to meet Eagle. Gross. Huh? I hope you're going to tell about yes. this. And um, Jeremy was with us. And I had made a few masks. Um, and one of them was a, for a baby. And on the inside of it had um, rose, blue roses on the belt. And we met Eagle. And this other car pulled up. And they got out. And said, oh, it's a baby. Eagle knew him. So he introduced us. And it was. It was a niece. His niece. Um, Maybe. <laughs> yeah. um, Justice Rose mm -hmm. was the baby, about six months old, maybe. And um, Vinny. 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 Vinny was the mom, the grandmother to Rose. And Justice. At any rate, I had, I said, oh, I have a, a mask for Rose. And it had the Rose, the baby's name was Rose. So we met them, and they were very. Or, you know, they were very, very welcoming, and they had business to do in the in the traffic council. So we left and did our whole thing that day. And on the way back, I wasn't. I had to pick up ten more masks. I wasn't going to bother shopping to, to give them. Um, but at the very last minute, I thought I have to do this. So I said, turn off. So we turned off, and I ran in. And who was coming out of the thing but Vinny, the grandmother? And it was like, oh, hi. She said, hi, Miss Shelley. <laughs> she remembered my name. So that's just kind of neat. Just hopefully we'll be able to go up and, and meet them again and be able to. A contact. A, a contact that just when we first got there, a baby named Rose, and they loved the, you know, we had something for them. And then at the very we were leaving, there's the other contact. And that's the same one. So they noticed what. Pray, pray too. So the church, the, our church, has been given 
$32 billion of medical supplies to be given away. Uh, no strings attached to them giving it to us, but many strings attached. It's equipment that was supposed to go overseas. It can't be resold, so there's a lot of legalities hoops to jump through, but the plan is to get this all on. It cannot be here in the United States. It has to go to reservations. So they're trying to work with all the legal stuff to try to get it on the reservations. But I mean, it's everything from pacemakers to EKG machines to uh, prosthetic limbs. I mean, it's just the warehouse, I was told, is just incredible. And this is often stuff that has been opened once, closed, re sterilized. Yeah. But once it's opened, you can't use it in the United States. You know, it's, so it's, uh, but they'll also do training, you know, for the medical equipment. The problem now is, is just getting it on the reservation because so many reservations are still closed. But they believe the medical also that was open to such huge opportunities. Now, the reservation is where you call us. No, not at all. The no, even D. She goes on and off. She goes on once a week for virtual. San Carlos, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it, it's Honda has had more cases, and they said, please, you know, keep your distance, that sort of thing. Again, they're not. I look at them and I'm going, I'm on, you see the resources. Uh, Eagle is one that sits at home. Okay, when he's not teaching language, he is taking care of their lawns. <laughs> that's what he, he says, I'm grass cutter, that's all I do. <laughs> okay. Um, but he's also the grandson of the kid But But he's sitting at home. He's already had COVID. He can't give it to anyone. He's native. You know, use him. <laughs> Get him out there. But, you know, again, just like, you know, any of our government or city governments or anything like that, you know, you've got the bureaucracy and oftentimes you need to look at it and go, what's going on here? Um, um, yeah, there's, there's difficulties up there. There's lots of, there's lots of people there. A lot of the reservations um, closed. A couple of them that Stacey and I tried to get to, um, other than the institution, I mean, they were closed. A couple of them were closed to the public. I think there was no so, Running overtime, way overtime. So I want to cut this off. And please, any any questions, you can holler at any time. Um, like I say, if you want to ask, People down here can do that. You know, just write up a request and put it on the church stationery and uh, get it up there. You can hear me down here. You have to see me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Introduction. I know the, the Oklahoma team has been working, like Brother Greg suggested, for many years. Um, started off as a handful of brothers, it's, you know, the, the grandsons of Brother Busey, and uh, felt this calling to go to Oklahoma and stumbling and picking up speed and momentum. And, and now it's really starting to be something, right? Uh, there's a lot of good things that are coming. There's a lot of really positive contacts. And what I always get excited about is hearing how God is blessing these people. When, when they have an opportunity to share the word of God with them, how open some of these folks are. They're, they're just like children, sponges for the word of God. And it just kind of sucks right into them. And the, the testimonies of the brothers have been, there's this amazing spirit that they feel in that place. And, and different than what they feel in a Gentile church. And they recognize they're doing something unique. You know, 
We can talk to people in the street, we can share the gospel, and we can be blessed, and that's a good thing, doing God's work. But when you're really reaching out to God's people, it's a bonus on top of that, because we're doing what this church has been called to do. We're not only bringing the gospel to the lost, we're bringing it to the lost tribes in anticipation of God fulfilling his promise. A promise he made in the 49th chapter of Genesis. I mean, we're going back a few years. God doesn't forget. And we're beginning to see now God's plan all coming together. And it's an exciting time to be in the church. It really, really is. So, um, no real announcements uh, for y'all tonight. Uh, we just had a regular service on Sunday, so we look forward to seeing everybody here. Uh, is there anyone here who needs prayer tonight before we subscribe? Uh, Andy texted me and said to please remember her father, Ruben, that he's having a pain again in his arm where he broke his hand. Okay. Is this weird? Um, I found out this morning that my granddaughter Jasmine has the COVID. Okay. The one here or the one that's up in. The other one that comes to church. Okay, here. She texted me earlier this week and said she was over the worst part of it. Praise God. Yeah, it's awesome. She's getting better, Sister Mary. God's heard your prayers already. Yes. Sister, I see you, but I'm going to get over here first. Um, Norma from Fox Street, many of you know her, she's a good friend of a lot of ours. She um, received some not very good news about her health. Um, the doctor wants to see her in person to tell her. She tested positive for a disease, and it could be one of two or three not very good diseases. She'll find out on, on Monday. She's hoping to come today after work and get anointed. So she might still come, um, but she's asked us to please remember to pray for her. Boy, she. No matter what, she thinks this. She's always so positive. Uh, but I know it would mean a lot uh, to her if she knew that our church was praying for her. So please remember the, um, the testing results we give them Monday. She knows we're over there, right? She doesn't come here. Right? So, yeah, I, mean, I can ask you a question. Are they going to have that um, turkey and stuff this year? You don't know. Yeah. I'm sorry, say again, brother? For Christmas. I think right now with all the COVID things going on, they haven't been doing much of anything. And now you think they're doing a, when she hasn't mentioned anything, you know, I still go to Fox Street every other week. And she hasn't mentioned anything of that. I mean, if something was going on, she would have already asked for some help. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, we do pray for me and pray for Owen and Diana, please. They are to stop. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's a great question. She said I was paying her leg. Yeah. Yeah. A praise a couple of weeks ago, we just sorry, we were over our office. A couple of weeks ago, we asked you, Gina said she walked home with a little boy who said he was born for a little heart surgery. He walked home with his. Coach, man, he just said thank you for praying for me. Did he have sir? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, that's really that's Jesus. I get Jesus. I still know his name. Yeah. yeah. Open heart surgery. Okay. He was a school so little kid. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's working. <laughs> I, <laughs> I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. No, I said the same thing to Gina. I said, no, it wasn't that long, honey. But she said, no. It's two weeks ago. She told us a prank. Yeah, it's what's needed. Yeah, it was the, we were here on Wednesday. It was that Friday. Mm -hmm. He was having surgery. I think it was. I don't understand. He was back in school today. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other prayer requests? Well, if there's nothing else, why don't we stand? We'll be dismissed. Brother Tony, can you do this? Heavenly Father, so grateful to see these here experiences, Father. And what Brother Greg mentioned, Father, the work in Oklahoma and every Father. We know, Father, that it's an exciting time to be in this gospel of Jesus Christ, Father. And as you see the Native American outreach, Heavenly Father, 
We pray that these are people, and we are your people as well, Father. Continue to bless them, Heavenly Father. As we do the work, Father, along the seat of Joseph, Father, we pray that you guide us and direct us, Father. And we wait for your promises, Father. You're giving us the patience, and Father, it's just, again, it's very exciting to see your hand, Heavenly Father. That you're moving your hand, Father. Remember those whose names were mentioned this evening, Father, those who are ill, Father, sick and afflicted, Father, we pray. Continue to touch and heal them, Father. You're the great God. Only you can heal, Father. We pray. We put our faith and trust into you. Father, be with us now through the course of this week, and even what you have prepared for us this coming Sunday. We pray and leave it in your hands, Father. Again, be with us now. We ask you for these favors and blessings, we pray in Jesus' name.